りそうですね Alright, this is episode number 26. Welcome to the Silver Fox Hustle podcast. I am your host, Shashi, an educator, a coach, football commentator, and a pundit. Now, before I speak to my guest, click on the follow and subscribe button and leave your comments. I've seen some、uh, great comments and、uh, keep those ideas coming in. Now, from the intro, you know that my guest needs no introduction. Now, he is well known in the football fraternity here and Southeast Asia. Just ask the Vietnamese if you don't believe me. <laughs> Now, he is the founder and CEO of Red Card Global. Now, in its role as an athlete's management company, the Red Card secured over US $30 million of signed contracts for their athletes. Now, over 15 years in event management, he has been involved in strategic planning and execution of over a thousand sports and entertainment events,、uh, events like the Tennis Premier League, the Daihatsu Badminton Masters in Malaysia, and so on. Now, he was also instrumental in bringing Jermaine Pennant to the S League, and that for a while brought the crowd back. He's also a football pundit and commentator featured in the last World Cup and for ESPN Star Sports as well. Now, all that, we haven't even spoken about what you've done as a footballer, right? Now, he is a former S League player and national player for the Lions with 35 caps, I believe, winning league titles and Scoring the winning goal in the 1998 Tiger Cup, a national hero. Now, welcome to the Silver Fox Hustle podcast, Mr. R. Sasi Kumar. Hey, great to be here. I'm a big fan of your podcast. It's、Thank、my,、uh, I would say, when I'm waiting for my kids、um, <laughs> during training, it's a, it's a go to place for me to、wow. listen to your podcast. That's great. That's great. Thank you very much. Now, before we go on and have a conversation, Sas, right? Disclaimer you have dabbled. Uh, uh, okay, dabble is the wrong word, right?、Uh, I think you wear many hats. You've worn many hats. You, you've, you've done so many things, right? And to be able to talk about all those things,、uh, I don't think it's possible because then it will take like two, three, four episodes <laughs> of, of the podcast and part one, part two, and whatever, right? So we'll pick out those things that's very important, and I think it's enough to actually inspire our listeners, right? So, right off the bat, I want to ask you this, and hopefully you don't get,、uh, you know, get off of this. Why do you do the things that you do, Sas? Everything, everything that you've done. I, I, I think you've been successful in, in your football career, your, your business, and stuff like that, right? But why do you keep on doing the things that you do? You know, the question just makes me look like a perennial job hopper or a, <laughs> a guy that just can't sit still.、Uh, there's some truth to that. But I would say that I view my life as a continuous experiment, right? Everything I do is a continuous experiment. Some you know, fail spectacularly,、okay. um, but some, you know, I get some success. Right. Right? Right. So I see it as an experiment. My worldview is very different. I must say that I think about the world and my life very different.、Okay. I, I think in pockets of experiments, like what do I want to experiment with my life? So you and I, we know each other for a long time, right? I was the skinny young boy、yeah. from Yishun.、Um, our thought process was very different、mm. back then. We were all trying to find our way in life. But As soon as I realized that you know, this is one life and this is something that you know, we need to be proud of, and especially coming from where I came from, I think not many people reach the heights that I have reached, right? And we all know that. We,、right. we, we share a lot of common friends and stuff like that. So I started to look at my life as different experiments that、nice. you know, put yourself out there. And don't be afraid to fail because you know, in our society, we know that failure is frowned upon all the time, right? right. But in other cultures, they wear it like a badge of honor.、Yeah. So initially, it was hard. It was very hard that you, know, you, you didn't want to fail in everything you do. But you know, God bless, I was very lucky with my football career.、Right. That experiment worked in some <laughs> way or form. And then when that experiment was over, then I jumped into being a businessman and entrepreneur. And you know, through that, I experimented with quite a lot of things.、Yeah. And some, like I said, some failed、right. and some took off. You know, in business, you just have to be right once. Right. It's, it, this, this is a great start because you, know, you, you are successful in the things you do. And I would love, it, you, you know, we talk about the tangibles, <coughs> the money that you earn and, and what have you, the trophies that you got, the medals that you, 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 you've gotten, you've won. <coughs> But, you know, this, this, this podcast is about that and me- more, you know, because I, I would love to get into the head of yours because you, you spoke about the, the experiments. Okay, not, not many people think like that, right? So 
this is this is what the podcast is a, is a, all about. You know, it's about the person, the character, the attitude, the mindset of our Sasikuma. So let's get there, right? Mm. And and I think, <clears throat> to be fair, let's get <clears throat> back to way back. Right? Okay. When when you were a child and and you were studying and and stuff like that, how was it like growing up? It was an interesting time, I think, <clears throat> because um, you know, like I said. I alluded to this earlier. We come from a very humble background. My yeah. dad was a taxi driver. My mom used to work in a factory. So we didn't uh, live with a lot of luxury. Right. Let's put it this way. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the middle child. Okay. I have an elder brother um, and my younger sister who... I think football was a way out for us. Okay. I think, you know, from where we come from, the escape was to, to play whole day. A mm. couple of weeks ago, I did a... You know, they did a profile on me, taking me back to Yishun yeah, Ring Road. Yeah. yeah, I saw that. So, very nostalgic. I yeah. think, you know, even put a tear in my eye because <laughs> I haven't been back in years. Like, in years, I haven't okay. been back. My mom just lives around the corner. I go there every week, but I didn't go ah, to the field right. where where a lot of things happened for me. So, I would say that sports was an escape. In school, I wasn't the brightest child, but neither was I stupid. You know, I was in between. <laughs> okay. um, because nothing interests me, to be honest. Okay. I was really good at geography because I love... Geography. <laughs> yeah, because I enjoyed traveling. I want dif- okay. I want to see different places. Okay. I understood that from that perspective, and I enjoyed it. I I like history because I love reading, and and uh, one of the things that why I'm wearing glasses is that very early I w- right. started wearing glasses because I read a lot. Uh, that's that's my escape. So childhood was you know with my brother playing football, and you know you couldn't find two different characters in life. Mm. You know my brother brother and I. Mm. He took a different route. I took a different route. Uh, but it was, I would say, it was a happy childhood in the sense that we played. We played a lot of football, played a lot of different things. But also, when I was young, I was an absolutely useless footballer, right? I was, I was just a, a, a tall lump that they would throw me in, in different parts of uh, the goal. They say, you're a, you know, you're, because you're tall, stay in goal, don't come out anywhere. I couldn't even make my kampung. It, this is typical, isn't it? If you're tall, you're a goalkeeper. If you're fat, you're a goalkeeper. These <laughs> yeah. this, 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 this two things, right? Yeah. Now, you, hold that thought, right? Football-wise, like you spoke about football, right? When did it actually start, like like just kicking around? When did it start, in primary or secondary school? No, we always play football, you know, yeah. in primary school. You know, I look at my primary school, uh, try to break into the school yeah. team. Uh, maybe not good enough, yeah. you know, play bits and pieces, and then, you know, then you progress to secondary school. Field hockey was my first love. Oh, okay. Right, when I went to um, Whitley Secondary School, I played field mm. hockey, and I was kind of good at it. I was a good striker. I enjoyed it. I played for a club uh, called Ceylon Sports Club, okay. played in the league and stuff like that, uh, and then got drafted into the under-15 team. Okay. But that was the turning point, right, because I didn't make the team. I was dropped on the... Oh, for the, for the final... The team that was traveling okay. to to KL, okay. which also included uh, our MP Christopher De Souza, right. right? Right. So he was our he was from SGI. He was the goalkeeper, and and I was one of the two in my school team that was picked okay. as well. So because I was growing, I was hitting that yeah. stage of maybe puberty. You can say that yeah. I was growing very very fast, and the hockey stick couldn't keep up with me, <laughs> right? And then we didn't have the luxury to go and buy a yeah tailor made stick, right? On the final day, um, the coach dropped me. The bro- school could have helped you out with the stick. No, it, they could have, but I think, you, you know, those days they don't think about such right. things, right? Sports is like, okay, whatever, right? So, um, but he dropped me and that was the end of the world for me. Like, you know, ah. you know, dash my dreams and stuff like that. But they always say, you know, when a door closes, another window mm, open. Mm. That's when I went all in on football. Okay. And that year, thankfully, we won the South Zone Championship. We went into the Nationals. For Whitley, you mean? Okay. And then got picked by Chegu Haru Musawa to right. come for the combined schools team. Right. And eventually made the combined school team. Okay. First trip to Bangkok. At what age was this? this uh, was I must have been uh, secondary four, 16. 16, 16 yeah. yeah. So, okay. And uh, that team included the likes of Zakaria Wang, Aidi mm. Skanda, you know, all those guys that eventually became my teammates at right. uh, youth level, I mean, under 23 and national team level. We all started there. Right, right. Well, uh, it's, it's funny, right? Like you said, one door closes, the, the other one opens. And, and I, I believe, in my opinion at least, everything happens for a reason. And mm. I, probably that, that was the reason. And just going back to what the, the, the players you mentioned, right? One caught my, you know, my, my ear or whatever, Zakaria Wang. Mm. What a player. Yeah. What a player. Even back then, I mean, I, I, I'll tell you, even back then when he was a young boy, I think he played for Jintai or somebody mm, like that. Mm. And when he was training, they were already saying that this guy is going to be a national yeah, team player. And uh, he was amazing, amazing player. Class. And left all left-footed as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. In fact, he was. I, we got 
we got smashed a few games in that tournament. I, I don't think so. I even played one game. I was just a squad player. Mm. He was easily our best player. Right, right. Uh, Zach, if you're listening in, a uh, shout out to you, right? Um, now, tell us your experience during Gibraltar Crescent days. <laughs> and when, when did you join? Because I know I was in the under-17 teams, I think. Uh, I, th I think so. So, so how did that happen? And, and tell me your experience at Gibraltar Crescent. So, I was playing after the combined schools team. I was training with the late Majid Arif mm. at Farah Park. Right. And I really enjoyed. He was, uh, yeah. you know, he really, really taught me what was football mm. because my formative years were all rubbish. I didn't know how to position myself past, mm -hmm. couldn't juggle the ball, but I was just physically very strong and I suppose at that age, more mature than many, many kids my age. Mm. Then, after combined schools, I played for Hai Singh Park Rangers right. in the mini league uh, under Majid Arif and played really well that year. Okay. For, I was clearly outstanding and oh, then... Oh, were you always a defender? Uh, no, I wasn't. Okay. Actually, I was a right winger. Right, right. Yeah, okay. and then and then Majid said, forget about it, <laughs> you are a okay. defender, you're a centre-back. So, got converted and then um, helped Hai Singh Park get to the, I think back then was Division 2 mm. in the NFL. That's when the opportunity to move to Gibraltar Crescent came, okay. closer to home, and they were already in the Premier League, yes, yes. and I started dreaming of thinking that, you know, maybe one day I'll play in the Premier League as well, right? And then came in there, and I was part of the under-19 team, mm. right? Yeah. Uh, Steven Raja was okay. uh, my, my coach then. Never got a look, look in at, of course, the, the Premier League level, mm. never got a look in. Then that all changed one day, okay. right? I got a, basically the, the club got a call okay. asking me to go on trial for the Singapore B team. Okay. So you were already playing in the first team then. Okay. Yeah, right? You were in the okay. squad and then okay. you started okay. playing, okay. right? So, I, and then they thought, the club thought it was you that's supposed okay. to go because you played, yeah. For, yeah. It only makes sense, right? Yeah. And after point confirmation, it was, mm. it was me. Right. So, um, I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. Like I, <laughs> you know, you wait your whole life for an opportunity. Yes, yes. You who was, who was the coach then at that? So, so uh, no, Robert Lee. Rob, okay, right, right. So apparently, only on hindsight, right? When we talk about it, uh, Robert had actually watched me play in under nineteen. Tournament. Okay. And obviously, he's seen something. Hmm. And at that time, Barry Whipret was in Singapore. I think his first assignment was to take the Singapore B right. team to Indonesia. Right. And then I went to training that day. Hmm. I was there, I think, two hours early because I was <laughs> super excited. And I knew that this was my chance, right? right? You wait a lifetime. I mean, when I look back now, right, that's the that's the butterfly effect, right? right? One right. thing leads to another, yeah. right? And if I had messed up that, that trial, for whatever reason, okay. I won't be sitting here in front of you. It would be like the, the, the second failure, right? After the hockey thingy. Yeah, yeah. So it's funny. Are that you sure? Are, are you sure it would be that drastic, Sas? I think so. Uh, let's not forget. I have not even played one game uh, for Gibraltar Crescent. Did you play any game? Any minutes? No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, uh, you you did sit on the bench though, right? But but yeah, not, sit on the bench. All. Never played one game. Okay. Uh, Amazing, right? Never even get a look in. Right. But obviously played a really important role mm. in the nineties, and we did really well with the team, right? Mm. And obviously that's I suppose they saw that right. and went to that training. I'm going into the dressing room. All the Singapore B team, uh, Singapore A team guys are in there. Okay. So these are the Malaysia Cup guys okay. that you watch. Okay. You and I go and watch. Which this. year was this? By the way? This was 1994. Right. Oh, that that, that same year that they won. Yeah. Right. So this this was towards the end. Yeah. So we are now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Was it 1994? I think it's nine. Yeah, could have been 90. Yeah, around there, somewhere around there, yeah. right? My memory. Yeah. So, and then the likes of V. Selvaraj, T. Ramu, yeah. all these guys were all. Zakaria Wang yeah. and all these guys that uh, Rudy Kairon, who didn't really make the first team, were there. Okay. So I'm going in the dressing room and they're all looking around and say, who's this guy, right? right. We right. haven't right. seen him play in uh, the Premier League, whatever. Right. So I just go right to the corner, put my back down. <laughs> Can and, imagine. And it was quite intimidating for a kid of course. coming out of Ishun. Of course. I think it was a lot to do with the self-belief. You get this imposter syndrome, mm. like, actually, mm. I don't belong here. Like, what okay. am I doing here? Okay. So, if you don't really have that kind of mental fortitude, right? Yeah. You'd have gone south. Right. First ball come in, you... Correct. So, uh, the trial was basically 11 against 11. They that's throw it. players in and that's it. So, I was on the bench as, as I expected. And then, Rob Lim said, go on. 
and then I put on the beep and I, I, as I say, my hair stands because I still remember it so vividly, right? And I was up, up against uh, Fami Abdullah. Okay. At that point in time, you and I know, yeah. he was a top youth yeah, player, yeah. right? Yeah. Beautiful left foot. But I know one thing, right? Fami can never outrun me. Right. I know that for a fact, right? right? That's my strength. Right. So if he ran, I ran. If I had to tackle, I tackle. So in that 20, 25 minutes okay. that I played, I think I put him in my pocket. Yeah. Clearly, he yeah. didn't get a kick, right? Uh, and I put in some really, really strong tackles. Yes. And as I finished the, the game, finished as I was walking out, and Barry Webb came to me and said, uh, "You know, he's in English accent, son. Where did you, where, where do you yeah. play?" Like, yeah. so I explained to him. He said, "You mean you didn't, you don't play in the in the Premier League?" I said, "No, I was just under 19 player." He said, "Listen, I think you're going to be a national player one day, right? Right? So I want you to take you to Indonesia." So I quickly went into the dressing room, mm. got changed. <laughs> I wanted to get out there very quickly. Okay. As I, as I, the old Jalan Besar Stadium, as I ran and, yeah. uh, and I walked very, very fast, got, got out there <laughs> fairly, fairly quickly. And then as I was getting towards the, where nobody could see me, I started to scream as loud as I could, right? <laughs> I realized that, you know, all I worked for, and as you would know, that the culture at Gibraltar Crescent mm. at that time was very toxic in that sense. Okay. All the humiliation, yeah. you know, putting you down. I suppose they they, they thought it was it was mm. kind of the way to go. But um, on hindsight, looking back, I think it's the worst thing they can ever do to someone, right? And 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 I said, man, this this is my moment, you know. Right. And a guy, you know, a foreign coach coming to say that you know that you're gonna be a national yeah. player one day. And I went back and told my dad and everybody was like, okay. And then the moment becomes real because they ask you to go and do your your suit for when you're traveling, okay, the national okay, team suit, okay. right? So I I mean I don't know why I was Katong, I was leaving an issue, my father had to drive me there. And then as as they're measuring and the guy is saying, Oh, you're a national team player, you know, so the uncle's asking you and, and that moment becomes really real. Like okay. you're wearing okay. the suit, right? Right. So went to went to Surabaya with mm. the team. Uh, unfortunately that's the tournament where Kamar Zaman died in that, ah, you know, there was a right, player that, right. you know, clashed with our own goalkeeper and right. died. Um, I was maybe 10 meters away from him. My, f my first game was against Malaysia. If you remember this character called as Tanasega. Yes, of course. Kada, top striker yeah. at the time. Uh, put him in my pocket, 70 yeah. minutes, they took him out. Right. So my currency started to, to, right, to right, increase right, bit right, by right, bit. Right. They kind of knew that, you know, probably they had mm. something that they could work on. And when I came back, and that's when the under-23 Olympic team squad mm. started with Barry, put that team together. So all this while when you are back and forth with the, uh, training with the B team and stuff like that, uh, you, you were still with Gibraltar in terms of uh, training and, and yeah. what, what have you, yeah. right? Now, let me ask you this. Did you feel at any one point, even before you got selected for the B team, right? And uh, got the call up, right? Did you feel at any one point in time that you think, I, I should be playing? Anytime? Um... While the season was on? Not really. I think there were pockets or moments that I should have played. Okay. I know that I, I should have played. Okay. Um, but no, not that. So you weren't happy because of the, 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 the whole atmosphere? Not, not because you weren't really playing? And it, yeah. yeah. No, nothing right. to do with the, with the, with the playing okay. side of it. I mean, if you're good, you're good, you play. Okay. Um, that's the, always the approach I had. But I thought that there was moments I could have played. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But it was just the way they, they looked at uh, a player development. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, they, I suppose, you know, you can't even blame them because you don't know what you don't know. And that, at <laughs> the back then, right, that's, right, right. that's all they knew, right? right? right so, right. Um, and I'm sure on hindsight, they, they, will, they will never do that. But that really, really deeply, one part of it affected me mentally. Especially for young players. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. because let's not forget, right? I mean, our background and all that, we don't have a, a lot of high esteem. Mm. You know, mm. we come from yeah. backgrounds where you're always told yeah. to be there, yeah. thereabouts, that this is your life yeah. kind of thing, right? Your paradigm is mm. completely different. Mm. So I suppose that, but set on the other part, I was like, screw you guys. I'm going to show you who I am, right? Right, right? I still remember very clearly one of the conversations I had with uh, one of our goalkeepers back then. Okay. He said, you know, I will be a national player. This guy was like 30-something. He said, I'll be a national player before you. Okay. Right? So, um, <laughs> yeah, it was funny. But <laughs> on, on uh, yeah, anyway, so, so I mean, that's all water under the bridge, right? But um, but that really motivated me to do right. a lot more things. With I, I, I think listeners, if you are listening, and especially footballers, or the, the young ones especially coming up, right? I, I think the, the, the lesson for the first part itself of this conversation so far is sometimes you don't have to listen to people. No, no, seriously. Like, like you know, you, you, you walk in and people is talking 
crap about you, but but if you know yourself, then then play to your strengths. Mm. Whatever it can be, football can be whatever in in life, right? I think that's the most important thing. And it could have gone south for you, like like you said. Oh. A- anyone, yeah. anyone would have gone. Especially walking into the dressing room for the first time, looking at all these players, and then shit. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm gone. Yeah, I'm not I, good enough. No, I I tell you, it was a yeah. it was a constant fear. You know, yeah. you you're living in constant fear that you got you you get found out. Yeah. People are gonna laugh at you as soon as you get onto yeah. the field. You know. Because I was not a skillful player, yeah. to be honest. I was I was physically very good. I was uh, I was a tough tackler. I was a good man marker. But yeah. when the ball came to me, I was like, I want to get rid of it as quick as possible, right? So, yeah, it could have gone either way, man. But you know, I suppose we all are put on this earth for something, right. and that was my moment, and I took it. And probably, uh, Mr. Robert Lim, if you are listening in, I I think uh, you you got something to say about Robert Lim as well. I I, I think wow, it if if you're talking about talent scouting or yeah. whatever right I, what can you say no i mean i i i, I say this on many many shows yeah. and i've said it in many many shows right um if robert lim had not gone to the under 19 match to watch me for whatever reason maybe he had a sore throat or he didn't yeah. the car or, or maybe not interested like not most interested, people are right? mo- like most people here, here yeah. are right and and <laughs> he went there watched me i did well enough that day yeah and you know, got that call. I'm eternally grateful to him, yeah. to where I am today, and I try and repay it in yeah. different ways, right? When I, the first thing I did when I bought a football club was to hire him as a coach, right? Right, right, right. Um, in one way, I'm grateful, but the other way, that I know he can do a job. Yeah, and and it's funny because you talk about and and uh, football scouts and, and whatever talent ID and whatever, right? They do seem to see things that other people don't as well. Mm. Right, you can be the best player in the world, but they can say no. He's, he's, you know, maybe his character is not good enough. Uh, things like that. So, uh, shout out to you, Robert. I, I, you, if you're listening in, absolutely brilliant. Now let's move on a little bit to your pro club football career. Right, we, we talk about, you know, we, we fast forward to the S League days. Mm. Right, was your first club Gela, in no. terms of the the S League? No, so I I actually started with the uh, SAF Warriors. Okay. Because I was still a serviceman then. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Right. I still had about six months of my contract okay. left. They offered me a contract. Uh, Ivan Resnovich was the coach then. For the following year, uh, after you extend, yeah, yeah, yeah extend yeah, my yeah. career, um, uh, extend my right. my contract afterwards. Um, I was the captain. They made me captain yeah. as well. Um, but I, Ivan got sacked. The coach got mm. sacked, and then Vincent Subramanian came. Right. At that point in time, I wasn't aligned to his okay his style. Okay his ideas, his principles, and he, even him as a person. Mm. We were not aligned. So even now? Uh, uh, no, I, I think things have uh, drastically changed okay. over many years. We are really good friends. Good. I have a lot of respect for him. In fact, when I was in Bangalore, he took me out, we met, and nice. and every now and then we get we catch up on a call and stuff like that. But then, I suppose, I was young. Mm. I was probably immature. He was very hot-headed. Mm. You know, I think over time, he's mellowed, as yes. we all know. Uh, I didn't want to play under him. Right. And at that point in time, I wanted to reconnect with Robert and go to Gela. Okay. Robert was the assistant. Nice. Jalal Talebi was there. Yeah. And then it also makes a difference when Fundy calls you, right? Right, right. So they knew our, my contract was up. Yeah. I had not signed and stuff like that. And I got a call on, on a call with Fundy. And Fundy said, you know, this project here is great. And you will do really good. Mm. Uh, come to Gela. Nice. So, yeah. Now, now Gela, right? You played with some great players. You know, you talk about Fandi and, and uh, Chris Riley and, and even the local players, right? Bidan as well, I think, was there mm, for, for, yeah. for, for a bit, right? Hamid Reza and Stili, Mohamed Kakpur. How good were they and how was the experience like? <laughs> I think, first of all, we got to look at them and human beings first, then we separate the footballer and the human being, right? As a young boy who thought that I was already a national team player then, you know, you're a big deal, and then you walk into the dressing room and you see... Iranian international players, the way they behave themselves, first of all, as professional players. I'll give you a story. This story still t- stays with me today, okay. and I tell this story to my boys right. who are aspiring footballers, and right. I tell them every day whenever I get a chance. I turn to I turn up to training one day, drove there, and I'm wearing my slippers, <laughs> okay. okay, and my bag, and I walk there. Hami looks at me, and and Mohammad looks at me, and I go to the the dressing room, and and then when I was walking out to the field. He said, come here. Really? Then with this, you know, with this very Persian English, you football player? <laughs> he asked me, you football player? I said, why? Is yeah, you national team? I said, yeah. Why you wear slipper to okay. training? 
You're not proud of your job. So I thought, what's, what's this guy on about? He said, your leg is your life. Okay. What if somebody, f something fall on your leg and cut? You cannot play. You don't help the team. You don't help your national team. So then I said, he's right. Like, right. you know, that's professionalism, right? Okay. We were still amateurs trying to be right. them, right? right? And, you know, that was one incident, right? So from then on, from then on, right. I never, ever, ever right. wore slippers to training or game, whatever. I was right. everywhere I, w I went. I'll, in fact, I chucked my slippers away. Right. Uh, even, uh, uh, even when I'm on the beach or somewhere, I'm still wearing shoes. <laughs> that is so deep rooted into my head that today I tell my boys the same thing. Like, right. when you go out of your house, if you want to be aspiring footballers, right. wear shoes. Right. Wear shoes, wear shoes. And, you know, so that's been ingrained into their head. That, wow. So that's a lesson I learned from them, right? right? Secondly, this was pre-season, right? right? Uh, obviously, Jalal just killed us. We've been running like <laughs> mad, as you know, pre-season. When we are dead, we're lying down. Right. And these two guys, they get up and do another half an hour mm. of hard running. Mm. Then I said, Hamid, Mama, we just finished. What are you doing? He said, you think I'm training for S League? <laughs> I'm training for the World Cup. Right. And guess what happened? Hamid scored at the World Cup. Yes, yes. Against US, uh, the US, right? US, yes. you know. So, talking about professionalism, that's why I get very upset when I look at half-picked foreign players that come and play in our league mm. who bring no value. Mm. When I walked with Giants, mm. you know, mm. these guys, I mean, Hamid and I would say Kapoor, and, as, and I had the pleasure of playing alongside Mohamed Kapoor. Yeah. And the stuff that he taught me took my game to another 20%, right? He right. said, cover here, do this here, do that there. Yeah. And subsequently, I played alongside Jiang Jung. Who also taught me how to do yeah. it. So, yeah. can you imagine? I mean, I, again, I get goosebumps because I played with players yeah. who were on a different planet and they taught me. So, as a young kid, I learned from the best. Yeah. Right. And yeah. today, I see some. You know, it's it's it's. I, yeah. You know, I I've been going on about this for a very long time. Right. You play with good players. You don't have to be the best player in the world. You you can play with someone who's much better than you. You will improve you, mm. you 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 won't be like them but you will improve i've been going on about this and that's why i've always had a problem with uh, you know players who come in who yep. who's the, of the same level then why there's no value they bring the, exactly you know so so yeah uh, of course not to forget right i mean the Geelang team you got 11 first team players then then 11 players to play for first team for mm. any other team correct uh, national team players ex national players were all on the bench right uh, to break through was hard it was hard work but yes. you know i i, I got quite a number of games right. and then the following season I became a mainstay of the team now forget about the foreign players the local players who are listening in to this podcast wear shoes <laughs> I, I, I'm serious right wear, wear shoes I, I know of some players who complain about this yeah. why, why should I wear slippers that's that's the reason my friend if you're walking you, you never know you yeah. never know right if you lose a toe let's, right. let's yeah. freak of nature something falls on your toe yeah. and it severs the nerve on your toe and you can't never never put your foot down again yeah. then what exactly right HUFC, Home United, right? Of course, now they, they've changed their, their names and stuff like that. Is it safe to say that that was probably the best time of your life in terms of club football? I, I would say so. Yeah. Um, in 1998, after we won the Tiger Cup, uh, there was a financial crisis, right? Mm. And, and of course, Geelang came back to us and said that they were, first things first, we all got a pay cut then, right. remember? 20% pay, pay cut. And... They didn't want to reinstate. I didn't want to, to increase my salary. I just want to say, can you reinstate? And I'll say, stay yeah. to stay with Kielang for another three years. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, they said no. Okay. And just at about that time, Home United was putting this project together. Right. Right. They hired Robert Alberts. Mm. They already had a core of the team where Zobox was there, Idi Skanda was there, um, and a few other players were there. They wanted to bring myself and Subramani. Mm. They already signed Vlado Bozinowski, right. Danny Tapai, wow. Ekma was already there. Yeah. So they wanted the literally the back line for the national team mm. because 98, three of us played at the back. And, you know, in that whole tournament, we considered two goals. Yeah. In the whole yeah. of the Tiger Cup. So we had this kind of a really good understanding yeah. when we played three at the back. Okay. You know, so you all played with three? Yeah. yeah. So three at the back was a 3 5 two formation yeah. and we created such a good understanding between the three of us mm. that it was hard to beat us, yes, right? Yes. Um, you know, I, I obviously was a, a physical presence. Money was quick as lightning. Mm. 
And if that missed, and then IE was a really yeah. good sweeper who could yeah. take, actually take the ball from the back, right? Mm. So, mm. after a lot of negotiations, I almost signed for Tanja Paga because money asked me to come to Tanja Paga. Okay. So, we were negotiating and then uh, Mr. Katie Belu at the yeah. time sat down and said, guys, we really, really need you. This is a project and offered out a, um, I think it was a two-year deal at that time. Um, so, we both money and I decided to sign. Right. And, yeah, I would say that, you know, um, Robert Alberts, I didn't get along with him as a as a person. Okay. I didn't rate him as a person. Mm. And I still don't rate him as a person. <laughs> okay. Um, because of the things he did. But, right. you know, again, like I said, it's so long ago, I, I you know, I've, I've almost forget, uh, forgotten and forgiven. But as a trainer, yeah. as a coach, one of the best I've come across. Okay. So meticulous in okay. preparation, so meticulous the way that he prepares the team. Mm that I always felt that if I ever became a coach, that's the style I would I would use. Okay. Coaching-wise? Coaching-wise. Yeah. And you would also see some of the coaches, like for example, like Ideal Sharin now, who's doing really yeah. well at Kada, he would tell you that he took a lot from Robert Alberts. Right. Right, his right. coaching style. Because he was really good at it. Okay. Like, the way he was meticulously mm. training from Monday to Saturday, he had a system and he worked for us. Right, right. Let's not forget as well, we had great players. Like, I'm talking about the best, the best in the It country. was a project, by the way, right? Yes. It's, 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 yeah. Yeah. And we went that season 21 games unbeaten. Mm. In fact, we won the game in the last last yeah. game, at one, one with one more game. Yeah. Went to Tanya Paga, that's why I, 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 I done my knee in the last game. Okay. Because the club refused to pay us a bonus for the last game. And we lost the game. Otherwise, we'd have had a perfect record okay. of running. It would have been the yeah. Arsenal Invincibles okay. that, okay. that year. But... The, the kind of football we played, yeah. the way we played it, the way we won games. Yeah, you're right. I think it was uh, 1999, winning the S League title there was special because fans couldn't get into the stadium, right. if and you remember. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. And if you, came to, if you came to Bishan, there's no chance you'll pick up three points. Right. There's and, no chance. And, and, and you talk about the players as well, you know, the, the, the local players and stuff like that. And, and I remember, I remember Ernie Tapai and uh, Bozzi because he, they, they came over to Clementi what, one year, right? And, and I tell you what, you, you talk about football, that's one. You know, great players, especially Bozzi. I, I really look up to him, right? The, the technique is mm. world class, right? Mm. But as a person, I think that's most important. I think you said it right at the beginning, right? I, I think the most important part is the, the, the value of that person. You know, as a person, as a human being, I think great guys, right? They, 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 they teach you a lot of uh, lessons in life which you s- subtly pick. Yeah. You don't you don't because you when you're in it, right, you don't really think about yes, it. Yes, yes. But you kind of try and imitate people you admire. Yeah. And we had one player and I, I think you know uh it's one day Amil. Yes. Yeah? Yes. He did everything what Bozinowski did. <laughs> the way he dressed, the way and then one day he went out to, to Bozzi and said, uh, Boza, can I have your boots? And then and Bozzi was so funny and he was in the dressing room and everybody started laughing, right? He said, Uh it's one day. Just because you wear my boots, you cannot be Bozinowski. <laughs> we used to call him Masali, right? Yeah, Masali. Yeah. Then he used to say, Boza, Boza, please, please. Just, just your boots, just your boots. I just want to pass the ball like you. So can you imagine those to the kind of characters yeah. in the dressing room that inspired players like him, right? right, right to right. do great things. And So I think when you look at our football, we've come from there to here, you know, so which is a bit sad. It's sad, right? You're supposed to take a different trajectory, yeah, right? Absolutely. Now, is, this is going to be a tough question. Who was the best player you played at home United? In terms of okay, let's let's break it down, right? Uh, best goalkeeper you played in at, at home United for or with? Or oh, with is it? Yeah, with. Uh, I I must say it must be Yazid Asin. Yeah, at, at home United. The first year he came. Right. He was actually the reserve. Okay. In a pre-season tour, Afeni Sabtu broke his hand. Okay. Who was supposed to be the first choice? Okay. And then Yazid Yazid was a was a young kid. Right. Came in, and that year he was a young player of the year. Right. right, so we, I, I would say because we had a very, very strong back line, we protected him quite a bit, right. but he was amazing. He was like, his reflexes was like cat-like. Yes, yes. Uh, defender, local. Played alongside? Yeah. Has to be money. Has to be money. And I, I think I, we, we've, uh, also not fair not to pick out ID because mm. he, we, we came in a, in a, in a group of three. Yeah, yeah. But I would say that uh, money, not just with the Home United, also with uh, the, the national team. Okay. Uh, particularly one game we remember it was the Sea Games 1995 in Jakarta last game so w- to finish the top of the group they, they play because Mani and I were reserves mm. we went to play against Thailand yeah. four top strikers Pia Pong Nati Pong 
what I would say, Maka oh. and Kathy Sook. Right. So each half, two of them played. Okay. At the end of the game, Money and I couldn't walk. And, we, and, and, trust, and you know this, we are both fit. We couldn't walk at the end of the game. Uh, and then Money gave me this look. It was quite funny because, uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think still today he's, he's one of my best friends in, in football. He's lovely. Midfielder. Local. Home United? Yeah, Home United. Gusta. Yeah. By far. Right. Maestro. Striker. What a player. Um, at Home United, um, striker, local. Um, that's a tough one. I, I'll say later on uh, was Indra. Yeah. Yeah. He could finish. Did uh, couldn't he? Super, yes. super fast. First three steps is world class. Especially in the box, right? Ah, the guy yeah. is a different, different finisher. But uh, don't forget, I also played with Amala Tibing uh, at at Gelang. Yeah. He was another phenomenal player. Yeah. Right. Now. In your opinion, what was the secret to Home United being successful? Like, yeah, you talk about players, right? But how about anything beyond that? Do you... It's the characters in the team, you know. Yeah. You know, team dynamics is very important. And I think over the years, you know, not just in, in sports, right? I also in, in business building, yeah. I've had teams. And I think the character of the teams are very, very important. Who's in there? Because if you have a toxic culture, then it goes very bad, right? When we look at the likes of our leaders back then, we had Zobuks, yeah. Hungarian World Cup, uh, yeah. played for Hungarian national team. Bozinowski yeah. played in the Premier League with us at uh, Ipswich. He went around the world, Sokaru, Anita Pai. Yeah. Okay, these these were the, the very strong characters. You look at a local, ID, myself, Mani, mm. you know, Azmi, yeah. Azmi Abdullah yeah. was a, so. You got six or seven boys that are can actually literally carry the team. Correct. Truth be told. Robert Edwards will put up a formation lineup the way we want to play. Yeah. As we get into the team, in, into the pitch, Zolp uh, will call us and say, okay, this is the way we're going to play, guys. <laughs> and we literally would change it and we still go out there. Really? And Robert knew this. Okay. Robert knew this, but he was a okay. smart enough coach yeah. to know that yeah. if the players can sort it out, I'll yeah. stay out of the way. Three points every week, he will take it any time of, of the day. He prepared the team well because we had leaders. We, they knew where to exploit and yeah. stuff to do. And let's not forget that year, while we won, we won 21 games unbeaten, mm. just three points behind us, us was uh, SAFFC. Right, right, right. So the race was so close right. and we were a phenomenal team, right? And they had a phenomenal team too. You, uh, you know, you, you spoke about the, 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 his coaching style and what have you. And, and that is also a sign of a good coach, right? You, yeah, you, you, yeah you, you say something to the player. He goes in and he does something else, but then it works, right? Correct. You can't just, you know, reprimand the player. You know, I, I think that's a sign of a good coach. You can't just... Like just like Messi, you can't go in and s tell Messi what to do. You, 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 you know, you, yeah. know what you can't teach those great players yes. how to play football. Right, right, right. Now speaking of coaches, Steve Darby, mm. how was he? So I had the the good uh, fortune to meet Steve towards the end of my career. Right. Because when I finished at Tampines, finished in a very very poor way. Yeah. I didn't end my career the way that I wanted. Okay. Um, and for six months I wasn't playing football. I was coaching in. I was a player coach for Tampines in the NFL, taking the women's team. But there was some sort of emptiness. Like mm. I didn't finish the career the way I, I started. Started talking to money and I said, uh, during the J June period, I said, can I just come and, and play? I don't want money, but I just want to end it the way I want to end it. Okay. And until today, there's, I'm very grateful to Steve Darby because the easy answer would be to say no. Yeah. Because team dynamics and stuff like that. He said, yeah, come. Okay. Right? Okay. Come be part of the team. I understand an ex-pro. So again, one of those characters that you know are, are great man managers, yeah. and more so, I think they understand football people. Right. He right. he knew that it was important for me. Right. And then again, he made a friend for life. He's uh, we talk on a regular basis. Yeah. He's someone that I really respect. And you know what happened because I was paid three hundred dollars. He just yeah. said I'll give you some allowance. <laughs> but in my second game, he he let me run into the pitch because if I played that two games, I'll get two thousand dollars. Okay. As bonus. Yes. So he threw me in in the ah, last five minutes. Right, right, right. So when coaches like that do, yeah, yeah. then you know that this guy is worth his salt. He understands people. And that's why I, until today, if you ask about... Oh, and I, the other day, I think I was listening to ID's podcast. Mm. Every player talks about uh, Steve Darby. Right. If you have crossed paths with him, you know that you know he's a, he's a, he's a top-class guy. First of all, again, a great human being. Yes. Because he's a great human being, he understands people. Yeah. And, you know, and that's why his football is so good. Nice.
Now let's uh, end the topic of the uh, local in terms of uh, club football with uh, Jurong FC. Mm. They, they they call them the Dad's Army before, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Now, but but you guys did pretty well, mm. did, didn't you guys? I mean, we talk about old plays or whatever. I still don't believe in that because if you're good enough, then it doesn't matter how old you are, right? You yeah. still can play the game. Now tell us about Sundram and the boys. So just before uh, 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 how I ended up at Jurong, a bit of a backstory because in 2001 I had finished my contract in uh, Home United. I went to France to try. Right. I went to a second division. I could have done it. Some agent tried to play a bit of uh, punk. I came back. Yeah. And then by the time I got back, all the contracts were taken. You know how it works yeah. here, right? Senior contracts, the big contracts were all taken and none of the teams that could afford to sign me. Then, obviously, there was two opportunities for me to go. Venga invited me to Woodlands, okay. uh, where Karatu was coach. I went there and it was a funny conversation that I had with Karatu because when I walked in, he asked me, who are you? All right. Uh, then I said, well, I explained to myself and then he said, what have you done in football? Mm. So this is me having won championships, back-to-back right, right, right. -back championships was with Gelan. Was, was that done on purpose or what? The I, I, I suppose, I, I, I don't know what it was, but it was not a smart man to ask a yeah. smart question like that. Uh, also shows his poor prepara yeah. preparation when talking to someone. Yeah. Um, and I didn't, I didn't like that. Yeah. Um, we are starting on the wrong foot. I said, thank you very much. I walked away. And then as mm. I was leaving, I got a call from Sundra. He said, I want to talk to you. So when there, as you know, as you know, Jurong wasn't a yeah. big club with a lot of money. He said, can you meet me? So I had a chat with Sundram. He said, I'm trying to do something here and I want to build the team around you. So mind you, this is the first time with no disrespect to Jurong, I'm, I'm actually taking a step down to play for a different team. I was at Kelang. Yeah. We won all titles. Yeah. We went to home United, yeah. riding high. Right. So the ego sometimes takes a beating. Mm. Then I realized that I need to repair my, my career. I really need to repair my career. Went there and Sundram said, I'm going to make you captain. Let's build this team around yeah. you. And then we had a great run. Right. We had some really, really good players. Right. Because the experience, and you know, going to play in, in, yeah. in Jurongi Stadium is not easy. It's not. Right? Uh, you got to sweat yeah. blood. Yeah. And and also, I convinced Sundram to sign in Fabio. Mm. I said, let's bring Fabio. Who could run the whole day. And well. he could kick. Yeah. He was an animal. Yeah. So we had uh, we had Choi, we had Pak Tae Woon, Rafi Ali came to join us. Gusta was there. I brought <laughs> Gusta back there as well. Then we had Bashe Khan. Yeah. Precious. Oh, yes. Um, yes, yes. So we had a good team. Yeah. Uh, and we had a very, very good team. And we had a... I, I feel sometimes sorry for Sundram because of the bad rap he gets. Okay. Especially with the national team and stuff like that. Yes. People take a pot shot. He repaired my career. Mm. Out of the 33 games, I played 31 games. Yeah. I was playing... I was at the top of my game and I was even surprised um, and to a lot of people why I wasn't called back to the national team. And that's the year Jan Polsen and the yeah. team lost 4 nil. Um, the media was even asking. I, I did. I, I would say from a personal playing experience, that was the best I ever played. Uh, but he repaired me because he gave me the trust, the yeah. responsibility. And I, when we took the team to the cup final yes, and, yes, and yes. lost to, right. to Tampines, right? right? And the very next day, Tampines offered me a contract to sign with them. <laughs> and tactically as well, I think he's great. Yeah, he's he very know, good. He knows how to... But I think, you know, what happened, I, I also believe that over time, he... he lost his appetite for being risk. Funny coming from a striker himself, right? Yeah. He started to play a bit more defensive uh, because he wanted to... That, to be honest, even at, get, uh, at Jurong, that was his style. Yes, yes. We don't concede goals, we don't lose. Right. But at the national team level, I suppose you can't do that. Right, nice. The national team, all right? Now, I think we talked about your first, you know, the, the B team and the call-up and, and what have you, right? Now, your very first match in the A team, playing for the full national squad, how was that? What was the feeling like, you know? So 1997, we were in uh, Lebanon, in Beirut. Mm. Asian qualifiers. Yeah. Again, a couple of the senior players are injured. We travel there. And Beirut is not a place to go and play football, right? <laughs> um, because hostile and yeah. stuff like that. So yeah. in that match, a lot of the young players started. Okay. okay. So Barry was already trying to do the transition. Yeah, yeah. So people like Tonghai out, Boana out, and all that. So myself and Mani and ID, that's when it started to form the, the back yeah. line of the national team. We played against Lebanon. Um, 25,000 screaming fans wanted, you know, spitting at you, throwing stuff at you, and they had huge fiberglass. So it's like the Italian yeah. uh, Serie A yes. games where the fiberglass goes yeah. all the way up, and was a was a was a cauldron, right? It yeah. was it was quite intimidating. But uh, before that, it was quite funny. The day before we were training, and it was hailing. We had to run for our lives. <laughs> um, but the whole experience was was really surreal, and and looking back, it was 
So we considered go very early. You no, know, I would say about 34 yeah. minutes, Samavira gave away a penalty yeah. in the box yeah. and then they converted it. And 70 something minutes, Zul scored a Zukipi, mm. uh, Zul, Zukan and yeah. Beautiful free kick. Yeah. Top corner, he put it, he picked his point, put it. The entire stadium, I'm not, it's super eerie, right? When we scored, <laughs> silence. Only 11 players yeah. and a few people running around. Yeah. Finished the game 1 1. We yeah. couldn't get out of the stadium for two hours. Okay. So that was the baptism of fire. The army had to escort us to the. And that was your very first match. That was my debut. What what match. what a what a first match, right? Yeah, I mean, huge, I mean, good huge. good performance as well. Yeah, played well uh, yeah. in 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 that atmosphere. It is safe to say that 1998 was your best year in terms of you know the the national team and and winning the Tiger Cup and, and stuff like that. Now just. I don't know whether I I think you've you've related this story almost a million times to <laughs> many podcasts and, and and what have you, right? Can you summarize that that tournament? Just just in a, I don't know how you can do that, but you know, try. I think, uh, again, a bit of a backstory, right? I almost didn't make the tournament. Okay. I had a, I was getting a knee injury. Mm. We went on a preseason tour to Bangkok. Mm. I didn't play. The coach was trying different formations, and don't forget, back then for the Tiger Cup, we had to qualify to play. Yeah. We played Cambodia, Brunei. That was easy. We breezed through. We won them, and then going to the tournament, uh, I was carrying a knee injury. And the last game I remember, Bangkok Bank. We were playing against Bangkok Bank. So Barry said, half time you're going to go in. So I ran into the dressing room, emptied a tub of deep heat on my knee. Wow. <laughs> right? My, my knee was on fire. Yeah. It was a good thing because I didn't feel anything. Yes. Played, lasted the 45 minutes. Mm. Then made the, made the squad. Yeah. Uh, I was fit to go and I made the squad. So again, that's another butterfly effect, right? Yeah. If my knee had given way right. then, I would have never made it to right. that. So we went there. With no fanfare, obviously, a lot of the senior players didn't want to go um, for whatever reasons. They had their own reasons. They didn't want to go? Yeah. Uh, that's the reality. Uh, you know, you can dress it up whichever way you want, but there were senior players that didn't want to go, right. which is okay, which is good for us, yeah. right? We yeah. got our chance, right? And if you look at the team, Barry was already working with the under-23s and trying to slowly mm. transition. And the core of the team was actually the under-23 with a bit of senior players and then other players like Mani, who, who was yeah. just coming in. And then we had the young boys like Lim Sun Singh and Amal Asli. So the experienced players were like whom? Like, like Kadeh, right. Rafi, Rafi, Nazri, okay. and Rudy Kairon. Right. These were the four senior players okay. who had been there for a long time. Okay. On the fringe was uh, Zakari, uh, no, not Zakari, it was um, ID, right. right? It was uh, Rizal, yeah. it was yeah. just already there, there about the national team. Yeah. And then the rest of us, uh, um, um, Gustav was there and all the other four players were there. So the first game against Malaysia, Nobody actually gave us a chance, right? No media yeah. went there except for uh, the late Santok Singh yeah. and Jose Raymond was there. Yeah. And we went there and I think the Malaysia game was, we beat Malaysia 2-0. Khalid Jamarus, I still remember, yeah. I, I marked him. Um, and we won 2-0. So they were like, okay, you meet, win Malaysia, it's yeah. fine. Against Vietnam, the home team, we drew 0-0. That's when everybody started to stand up and say, hey, yeah. this team's got something about them. Yeah. And then the whole experience was going to from Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh, Ho Chi Minh yeah. back and blah, 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 going back and forth. And looking back, it was quite an experience, yeah. right? right? Experience. And then, and then um, what happened in the semifinals with the, or the that debacle of, um, I suppose, Thailand and yeah. Indonesia, which then got us to face Indonesia. My, in my opinion, we could have played for another three days. We would have smashed the Indonesians all day right. because we were just so angry the yeah. way they treated yes, us. Yes. In fact, the they team... wanted to meet you. Yes. yes, it was a funny team talk though. <laughs> so Barry went went into the dressing room. He put a article yeah. of what happened. Yeah. And then he said, "If you guys are worth anything, read this. Mm. Go out there and show them. Same lineup from the team. No, that was the team talk. Yes." We were like a bunch of hungry lions in the tunnel. Like I was, you know, you could see the rage in yeah. us, right? Okay, you want to play us? We show you. Yeah. That, that's why I say it. we could have played for three days. There's no chance in hell Indonesia would have beat us because we're first to the ball. We're aggressive. Yeah. Indonesians knew. Like yeah. they bottled it. Yeah. Like we don't deserve to go, right? These guys, you know, we, we disrespected them. And then we won the game. Right. And then, of course, the final was a different story altogether against uh, Vietnam. Yeah. That was um, until, <laughs> I suppose, until the day I die. That moments, uh, you know, because the history, right? Mm. You know, I think it was Troy Hercules that that said, "You got to put your name on the wall." Yeah. Right. I think we all put our name on the wall because we're the trailblazers. Right. And uh, yeah, the rest is history. I, you know, 
almost had a punch up with uh, Kadeya. Yeah, yeah, I heard about that. Because we wanted to win so badly, he's yeah. a winner, I'm a winner. But you know, in the end, it was ironic that he crossed the ball for me to score. Exactly. Now, uh, when you lifted a trophy, right? So what was that the point that you 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 know yeah, the naysayers can from before from yeah, yeah, I don't know which year right nineteen ninety yeah. or whatever nineteen ninety four or whatever was that the point that you said well there's nothing else to prove right I I suppose when you are carrying the trophy you're in the moment you don't yeah, think about it right and you're lying down in in bed and then you 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 think back of, of all the humiliation on all the mm. disappointments. And all the experiments that failed, mm. you know, mm. and all the people who said that you can never make it. Yeah. Uh, to all those guys, thanks. I would say like, thanks for motivating me. Nice. Uh, because without that, there's no chance I'll be here. No chance. Right. Now you you earned thirty five caps exactly thirty five caps. Yeah, right? about around about thirty five caps. Let's do not forget you, back then we didn't play many international games as well, right? Do you do you regret not getting more or it you you ran? No, I think course. I think I think. Given where I was in my career, what I achieved, thirty uh, five was 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 nice. Yeah. I I think I should have been back uh, when I was in Jurong. Mm. I was definitely okay. definitely a starter for the national team. Um, I I knew I I was at the top of my game. Mm. Maybe another year, yeah. but but no regrets. I think okay. uh, my time with the national team, um, I enjoyed it thoroughly, and you know no regrets at all. Nice. Some quick football questions, right? Best coach you played under. Best. Oh, that's tough, man. You, uh, it, it's it's a uh, different coaches bring different things, yeah. but I would say Barry Wibrit. Nice. Best defensive partner. You answered that. Best club you played for. Um, that's a tough one too. I would say Home United. Yeah. Okay. Toughest striker you came up against. Ali Dai. Wow. Ali Dai played against Ali Dai when he was Piruzi. He was weeks away from moving to Armenia Belafil in the mm. Bundesliga. Yeah. We played in that Philips tournament. Yeah. By far, so strong. Right, and it was a quality player. Uh, toughest opponents in terms of uh, club and country, right? Opponents, team wise. Team wise, I would say <clears throat> when I was at Geelang, we played in the Asian Champions League. We played against Kashima Antlers. Okay. When Zico was the coach. Right. Um, we we took the lead one nil. Indra <laughs> scored in Japan, <laughs> and then he got sent off, and then we got pumped six one. Indra got sent off. Yeah. He, For what? He, he, kicking the ball away twice. Two yellow cards, oh. right? And uh, Hamid got a screamer from halfway line. I think like thirty-five meter. He let one go in the top corner. Right. Everybody looking at us, they say, "What do we do now?" <laughs> right? uh, but we got pumped. Six-one uh, in the game. They were they were on a different planet. These Japanese footballers were on a different planet. Like that day, I realized that I wasn't a footballer. Right. Country-wise, best uh, toughest. Thailand, ninety-seven. Okay. Sea Games. I told you the four strikers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now, worst game you played in. You, I mean, you, you feel it. It's not about the papers writing stuff about you, but you, you felt like, shit, this is crap. Uh, national team or uh, both club. Uh, I, I would say national team. I didn't have too many okay. bad games. I, I thought I, I always yeah. was consistent with the national team, but club. You know, as usual, we all go through a slum, yeah. and, and and I suppose, um, yeah, at at home United I had some bad moments. Not yeah. not in the first year, but second two years because um, I had some. Some psychological issues at that time, okay. you know. Obviously, so uh, there were four, five, six games where, and and also at Tampines, I had bad moments at Tampines. Okay, now this is going to be tough, right? But good luck to you. Name your best eleven in what? the in the S League goalkeeper. Come on, off your head, off your head. Um, um, as as in the one I played with or anybody. It it doesn't matter. Rizal Hassan. Rizal Hassan, great. Uh, right back. Kadia, yeah. We go with a four, right? Two uh, two centre backs. I would say Kaku. Yes. And Subramani. Left back, Zuzana. You left yourself out, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, let's go with uh, three, three in the middle, right? Uh, three in midfield. Yeah. Okay. Defensive mid, Fabio. Two midfielders. Um, Gusta. Right. And Bozinowski. Nice. Uh, on the left. Um, the left, I would say. <laughs> it's quite a lot. I, you know, nobody comes to my mind now. Um. Yeah, we got a couple of right? Suti and then. Yeah, I didn't. I, I didn't yeah. particularly enjoy playing with those guys. But uh, who who can I say? Um, uh, who was the national team left midfielder? Or maybe Vira. Right. Some Vira. Uh, on the right. Uh, on the right, I would say. Um, give me a hand here, man. There are <laughs> so many good players I played with. Um, 
Mm. Fine. Just uh, two strikers. Uh, two strikers, I would say uh, Fandi and Ekma. Right. Lovely. I, listen, that, that, that was tough. You know, it, it was tough. I understand. Right. Forget about football. Right. It's gone. Out of the way. Right. This is 2005. Right. And, and you, 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 football is gone for you. You founded Red Card. Mm. Right. Now, before that, just, just a quick one. How was retirement for you? Because I know it, it, it can be tough. It's Look, very tough. You, you talk about uh, foreigners and what have you, but locally as well, we, we've seen players falling by the wayside mm. doing stuff we wouldn't want to mention, right? How was it for you? It was very tough. I think when you take away the most important thing in your life, all you know, all you trained, yeah. that's what your life li lifestyle is. Yeah. Very tough. I, in fact, I must say that I was really depressed for about six months. Like, wow. really depressed. But wow. I also know that that race had come to an end, right? Mm. But sometimes you, you always wish that the phone rang. Okay. That someone yeah. somewhere is going to call you because they're suffering and they need a defender. They're yeah. going to try and ring you, right? <laughs> but one of the good things I did was after I finished at Home United, I had a chance to move to Australia. Mm. I had the opportunity to work there in an agency. So I took off. So that kind of took away mm. the lack of football. But actually, when I got there, one of the, my teammates that played with me at Jurong, George Gutzulis, okay. he said, hey, bro, you're here, come and play for my team. Yeah. And it was a state league team. Right. Decent, very decent level. Okay. And then when I went training with them, and then the coach said, uh, you know, obviously you're an international player, blah, 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 I want you to play in the team. And they were training almost every day. I said, I came here to <laughs> retire from football and yeah. you know, my second career. Yeah. So, but what happened is that the chairman of the club was a Fijian Indian guy, okay. um, very wealthy guy, and he has his own team, which is the third okay. team, which is primarily made of Fijian Indian boys okay. who live in Australia, uh, in, in Melbourne. Yeah. Started playing with them because they travel all across Australia to New Zealand and okay. all that, to Fiji. Right. On the weekends, he said, uh, you know what, come and play with us and you can help my younger boys. So that was great. So every weekend I was going to okay. Sydney, <laughs> Melbourne, I mean, different places to play. So ended up playing there and after a year I came back because I just got, in, I just got married and my wife didn't follow me. It's a tough decision because Melbourne is a beautiful city. Okay. Um, it was whether do I carry on my career, mm. which we did really well, and and do I come back and you know kind of make the marriage work? So I decided to come back home, yeah. do the right thing. When I came back home, I applied for a lot of jobs. Mm. Even though I had a fairly senior job in Australia, I couldn't land one job here. Nobody. Yeah. I went to Q Sports, GM, went here, went there, asked different people. Nobody wanted to give me a job. So I said, if I can't find a job, I'm going to create one. Right. That's when I started Rika Global. Yeah. The low-hanging fruit was I wanted to uh, be a football agent. Okay. So I started with the football agency. And then a year into it, I had a Japanese agency called Densu. Mm. They headhunted me and asked me to come and start their sports division. Right. So I went into the big MNC, big company, understood how a big giant works, mm. um, and learned a lot. Learn okay. a lot about the way, how people work in a corporation. Yeah. You know, as footballers, we'd never seen yes, all of that. Yes, yes. But leaned on a lot of my sporting, I suppose, experience. Yeah. And that's what I brought to the table. So I didn't try to be somebody I was not. Like I'm a big corporate guy. No. Yeah. I just took what I knew from football and okay. added a lot of value. But I left on the same day I joined a year later. Okay. Because I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur and okay. being in a big organization curtailed that. Right, right. And uh, okay, before that, why Red Card? The name. I'm talking about the name. Yeah, right? as you know. How many times have I been sent off in my life? I don't right? know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, so I needed a name and I wanted to be synonymous with my past mm. and something that had a very good brand recall. Okay. Everybody knows Red Card. Okay. Top of mind recall and I wanted to attach that to my personality. Yeah. Right, right, right. Now you once told me, right, I'd rather work for myself than to work for someone. Mm. I, I recall this and it was a long time back. And what was your goal in actually starting Red Card? Your, your, your ultimate goal was... So I, I had some reasonable amount of success in football, right? I, I with very little talent, I reached the apex. Mm. You know, again, like I said, I, I put myself in a bit of history. Then I said, how can I test myself, right? Yeah. I'm a big believer that I should be pursuing my own dream rather than building somebody else's dream. Okay. And I've always had this itch of, itch of being an entrepreneur. I started at 15 years old. Not a lot of people actually know this. Mm. I started a tea party, you know, those <laughs> days we call tea dance and all that. <laughs> right. That one, you know, crashed and burned spectacularly, okay. losing $900. Yeah. Luckily, friend's mother, one of the partners in that thing, said, 
that was a lot of money, my friend. Yeah, in the, in fifteen, in, yes, a lot of uh, uh, maybe a million dollars, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but she helped us, and she said, you know, well done for being entrepreneurs and trying and failing. So I always had this itch that I need to create something on my own. Okay. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I started. But also, what I wanted to do is that I. Then when I started, my idea of success was completely different. Okay. Cars, houses, bling bling, yeah. you know, and all of that. That was my focus. Okay. Naively so. Right. And that's how I started. But the 15 years in business, as you can see, my grey hair teaches you a lot of lessons. But but you, you spoke about all those things, right? I, you talk about the tangibles, right? But it's all right. If, if you do it, it's fine to... No, there, I, there's nothing wrong with that. But okay. I think, um, you know, and I say this a lot on all the podcast, different interviews yeah. I go to, right? When you start to attach yourself to material things, mm. right? I think that's when things go wrong. Right. Right, really go wrong. Right, it's not wrong to actually enjoy the finer things in life. Okay, but has to be done in moderation. And because you have the things you have, ego becomes a huge thing. Yeah, and we all know when you live with your ego, everything goes pear shape. Right. So I suppose at some point when I was doing really well, I lived with a lot of ego, and and I got a really um, good kick up my backside for mm. not leaping with ego. So. Being an entrepreneur is not just building, I think, success with material, mm. but it's a lifelong learning lessons and a journey of self-realization, which I, to me, that's the success. And it's and it's a it, it's tough, isn't it? Being being one because uh, you know I I'm, I'm on LinkedIn and I've been reading lots of stuff as well. And and some, someone somebody say that if you want to be one, not anybody can be one. It's mm. it's like. You know what I mean? It's it's not, it's not for everyone. No, it's not. I'll tell you why. For the first five years, I was running around chasing my tail, doing almost anything to pay the bill. Okay. Next dollar I'll take. So you lie down on the bed and you turn around, your wife's looking at you like, what the hell is this guy doing, right? Not not really contributing to, to, to things that are <laughs> happening. The, to the house's uh, uh, the, economy. Uh, yeah, so, and then she's doing quite well. And then you listen to yourself and say, what am I doing? You turn around, she's saying what you are doing. And it's, it's a lot of doubt. But I'm, I'm going to say thank you to my wife because she stood yeah. by me for many, many years when I was experimenting. But like anything, right? Like I go back to my football career, mm. if you stick to it and work at it, mm. at some point you're gonna make a break. Something's gonna break you or yeah, <laughs> the yeah, the yeah. thing that you're working yeah. on, right? So after the five year mark, I think that's when I truly understood what was business. Right. I tr- started to focus in on what I want to be, what my brand right. stand for. Then we got breakthroughs. Yes, we yes. got breakthroughs. We did some really really cool stuff, and then the trajectory was upwards. You speak about speak about the few breakthroughs. And, and, and how successful you guys got? So, so I suppose, you know, um, we were doing things that were ad hoc. Yeah. Right, whatever came. And, and then one day I was, um, I suppose, we, as, a, as a sports agency, we always wanted properties. Okay. Assets that we can own long term and build it, okay. you know, so that year on year we are building on something rather than chasing different things, right? And right after the Youth Olympic Games, mm. I saw that that team had some sort of value. Okay. The whole nation got around them. But it was a waste that after that, everything yeah. started. And then I looked at the tournament, the Lion City Cup, right. which was an iconic event yeah. in Singapore football. Every player we know came through that yeah. Lion City. Right. And I looked at it and said, three years was underwater. What can we do with it? Because yeah. I'm a big believer of iconic brands. Mm. If you look at your Bata or anything, yes, right? these yes. are all iconic brands, right? So hi- some history. Did some research and this was... 1977 yeah. was the first. So I made my move and I, at that point in time, I didn't tell any of my, my staff. Uh, what I like to do is that I like to incubate an idea and get it to a level where I can actually share with the world. Okay. Then once I get to a level where I can share with the world, that's where the accountability comes. If you start too early, people start yeah. shooting it down and then never takes off the ground. Okay. Right? That's something that I learned along the way. So I incubated it. I had a meeting with the general secretary then, asked him a few questions, blah, blah, blah. And then structured a deal that they said, okay, we'll take over the tournament for one dollar, whatever nominal fee. We'll pay for everything. We'll run everything, and this is what we're gonna do. The moment we signed the MOU, uh, by the time obviously my staff knew, I was already having chats with the uh, sponsors, yeah. Canon. Yeah. And then they came in for a million bucks. Wow. Right. Right. Um, so, from an idea, it became a reality. Yeah. So I'm a big believer that. Anything starts with a thought, mm. then becomes a reality. Right. Right. 
and especially when you start writing things down, it becomes even more real. Mm. So that was the breakthrough. And um, again, eternally grateful for the clients, Canon, to see the vision of the tournament, like right. how we sold it and, right. you know, and they got great ROI on their investment as well. And in the process, like, we really put ourselves on the map. The games were broadcasted globally. Right. Like in Brazil, they were watching our boys playing live in mm. Eurosport. So that grew my business. Yes. And then that was the first breakthrough. The second one was, um, I was in the toilet sitting on the throne <laughs> and I had this idea like, how can we own a media asset? Mm. So I said, well, the first fundamental idea was, let's own a radio station. Okay. That was the start. Then again, I incubated the idea, took it to a level where I said, okay, where is the op where are the opportunities? Until today, and that, that one project I'm really, really proud of because okay. I, it was a seven-figure deal yes. that we did with the Starhub mm. without owning a piece of mic or a headphone. <laughs> I sold a radio station on PowerPoint. Wow. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Now, I, I love what you said just now, right? Everything starts in the head. Listen, loads of people have things in their head. <laughs> in terms of ideas, I'm talking about ideas, right? I've got ideas of anyone out, out, of, out of this door. They have ideas. But to to do it then, after that, right? From the from the idea and then to do it. Because lots of people have ideas, but they don't do it. Mm. Why do you think so? Because it's about the doing, isn't it? I, I can have an idea right now. I want to sell this, but I don't do it because... Why? You can ask yourself that, right? So I read somewhere they say that the cemetery is the most... The, is the richest place. <laughs> because that's where great ideas actually died with people. Okay. It never came to life. Right. right? Every man in the cemetery might have a great dream, the next billion dollar idea. I think what stops people from doing is ultimately is the fear. Okay. Fear of what? Fear of failure. Mm. Fear of being laughed at. Mm. Uh, fear of losing money. Losing money. Yeah. Various fears. Yeah. See, I came from a premise where I came into the sports marketing management game where it was reserved for the Europeans, the Americans, the Japanese game, right? all the bigger big agencies. Yeah. There is a guy, ex ex national player, coming into this game where we buy rights for millions of dollars and what's this guy doing so they first laugh at you mm. then after that they ask you how are you doing it mm. and thirdly they ask you how can i join you mm. right the reason why people don't do that is that they don't take the idea out of their head and actually make it real for the fear of ridicule the ones that actually do are the one percent of this world mm. that actually make things mm. happen mm. the podcast this podcast started mm. as an idea yes you executed it by drafting your script yes. booking the yes studio and booking a guest, then yes. it became real. So I think a lot of people don't do that. Right. And I suppose even when it was absurd for me to start a radio station, yeah. absurd idea, like eventually when I told my wife, she looked at me and said, what, you know? <laughs> and when I saw Channel 225, September someday in 2013, mm. when I switched on, on Starhub Channel 225 mm. and I saw our radio station live, yes, yes, yes. then I sat there and I put my hand on my head and said, it's amazing what a human being can do mm. with just a thought. And, and without, like you said, without the tools, in terms of the physical tools, right? You talk about the headphones and all this. this let, yeah. let, me, let, me, Sashi, let me tell you, I didn't put one dollar into it. Right. Not one dollar except my time, which if I yes, value yes, my time. But I saw a multi-million dollar project. Wow. Now, very quickly, right? Commentating and being a pundit. How good is that? It, it's, it's, to me personally, right? I love the job. Mm. Right? Mm. It, it, it's, it's like you, you love... We do that almost every day in mm. the pub, in the coffee shop, <laughs> at home, talking to your friends. Uh, after a game, we, we, we talk about football, right? How good is that job? <laughs> you know, I, I, again, as I finished playing ESPN, Star Sports those days when they started doing really well with the whole cable TV, yeah. English football, mm. I was a pundit on that. You know, you get recognition across Southeast Asia, yes. India even. You know, when I first started, I still remember the first day on the show. Yeah. I went back home and told my wife they're never gonna call me back again. Like I was, you know, I'm, yeah, 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 I'm yeah, rubbish. Yeah, yeah. But fast forward today, I have my own radio show. Right. So right. you know, like anything, you're gonna suck at first. Yeah. Right. If I, again, going back to the experiment thinking, if that experiment I quit because people are laughing at me, mm. they made it hard. And as you know, those days, the, yeah. the boys at the ESPN and Star Sports don't let you in easy. Yeah. It's yeah. a big old boys club, right? Yeah. So you gotta fight for your place because. Yeah. You have some value because you're an ex-national player. You played the game at a, at a decent level. 
But you've got to persevere. Yeah. You gotta, Especially for a local guy. Yeah, right? of yeah, course. You've you got to <laughs> shut out the, the noise and just keep going. Right, there's right. some people who help you along the way. Right. And then there's some people who say, what's this guy doing here? And especially the first time. I remember, right, my first time as well, you're going in there. And, and I seriously, until now, I hate looking at myself. Like, like you know, watching, I mean, watching myself over, right? You, you just you just don't Cringe. like... Yeah, you just don't like the idea. And then you learn from certain things that you do. Yeah. Maybe the ahs and the mms and, you know, you, and then you start to build up from there. Yeah, I totally get that. Now, 2017, right? Sports Entrepreneur of the Year at the Pentagon Awards. Now, was that a reward for all the hard work you did? Before, it's a nice recognition, right? Yeah. Awards are, you know, it's like a train station, right? You get past a train station <laughs> and you say, hey, it's here, I'm here, I'm, yeah. I've arrived, some sort of mile markers, right? It was nice. It was yeah. really nice to, to be recognized as a sports entrepreneur uh, at the Pentagon Awards. But uh, and that was alongside, uh, you know, the Crown Prince of Johor, yeah. TMJ, he won as the leader of, of yeah. football and stuff like that. So it's a nice recognition. But awards don't pay bills. Mm. Right, you got to be very clear with this, yes. right? It's a nice recognition, but they don't pay bills. So, like I said, as I get older, I try and detach myself from the ego way of thinking as much as I can, as I'm only human, mm. right? But um, you cannot drink your own Kool-Aid. That's mm. the important thing. Right. Like, don't don't drink your Kool-Aid because you're a sports entrepreneur. There, that means jack off. Right. Yeah, you still got to do the work. Nice. You are now the producer and presenter of Sports Talk Saturday and Sunday on uh, CNN 938, right? And, and I know I, I've been on your shows as well. Now, how has that been so far? Uh, listenership numbers, I, I think it's been encouraging you. Yeah, very good. I think I started a year ago, exactly maybe a year ago. Was this your idea, by the way? Or so, so I had a chat one day with Walter Fernandez, who's the um, chief editor at, at uh, I suppose, CNA and Media Corp. It's a casual chat and he said, hey, why don't you come and start your own radio show? I was like, what? And that's been one of my childhood dreams as well, mm. right? From, uh, of course, you know, being an owner of an online radio station and I hardly actually got on air. I let other people yeah. do the job, right? And now having my own radio show, first it was daunting, uh, like anything. In terms but, of what? Um, you know, to host your own show is not easy on national radio. <laughs> Tell me about it. Yeah, it's not, not <laughs> yeah, easy, yeah, right? Yeah. And, you know, and there, I do everything. I script, yeah. I book the guests, I produce the shows, I present and stuff like that. So I kind of underestimated the entire <laughs> experiment. Yeah. But I suppose like anything, if you keep at it, mm. I created frameworks like I always do. And, you know, just, just pushing on. And uh, the last wave, which is how they measure your listenership, right. we have about 200,000 listeners on the weekend. Wow. For, for both uh, Saturday and Sundays, Sunday, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's a sizable audience right. and the more encouraging thing is that wherever I go now people come up to me and say hey I listen to mm. your show mm. which is encouraging from a monetary perspective it's not a great gig for my time okay yeah uh, I'm I, I, I've said it from the start I'm not there for the, for right. the money but I now be completely honest it's a great for pro profile yeah great to be associated with a yeah. with a brand like CNA mm. and you know like you said Sassi, I talk about sports I love this this is what I love doing, right? Yeah. And I don't see it as a job. Right. I really don't. Right. Otherwise, I'll be talking to my friends, yeah. right? So, and what has been great is that people have interacted with me a lot yeah. through the shows. And like you say, you've been on the show yeah. and a lot of my friends been on the show. What I really like is that I tell stories about mm. former athletes, yeah. current athletes. Yeah. And I get the feeling when we are jogging back people's memory, they are so proud of what they achieved and the connection I build with people are on an emotional level now. Yes. Which otherwise you can't. Yes. Right? And that part of it, I extremely enjoy it and I hope that I can keep doing what I do. I understand that, uh, you know, the emotional part where you get to know someone, when you speak to that person for one hour, is enough. That one hour you you know and sometimes they, they, they can even cry on air. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I think you, you spoke about that and, and I get that a lot with my guests on the show and mm. especially people you don't know before. And then you talk to them and say, wow, this is... It's more to the person then. Yes, yes, it's amazing. Now, some hard truths, right? Mm. I, I think this is the best bit as well. You know, I, I think we would love to talk about this. Failures. Uh, tell us one or two failures that you had and, and what you have learned from it. I, th I think that is important as well, right? So at the start of the show, I talked about experiments, right? Yeah. Doing various experiments. And then as an entrepreneur, you get to a level where... You can now start to experiment a bit more. Yeah. Obviously, you, you have a bit of equity, cash lying around to to, yeah. to do that. 
So one of the things was what quite public was uh, I had a failed academy. Mm. Um, I don't like to dwell too much on that because that's bad, bad vibe. But because you asked me, I'll, sh I'll share. I think it's relevant. Yeah. It's only then I realized that my, my personal brand, that means my, my name, yeah. actually means something. Okay. Because when you lend your name to something, you okay. by default become responsible yeah. for it. At the same time, there also comes a financial value to that brand. Okay. So how people treat your brand, you are in no control. So I realized that you can't just, I'm just not an ordinary guy. Because yeah. I'm newsworthy. If something yeah. goes wrong, I'm newsworthy. Right. So obviously, poor judgment of mm. hiring or, or working with people. In fact, in that whole transition with the, with the academy, I was just supposed to be an ambassador of thoughts, put my intellectual property yeah. in there and be a passive um, yeah. partner in it. Unfortunately, it all went pear-shaped and I had to pick up the pieces financially as well. So actually, okay. not my brand got damaged, mm. my, my finance also got damaged in that yeah. whole process, right? But more so, it also gave people an opportunity to take pot shots at me, okay. which was a bit more disappointing in the sense that okay. otherwise a clean paper, there's a black spec there. Yeah. So I suppose even until today, people pick that up. Okay. And but you, you know, still have people talking about that. Oh, absolutely. I think people talk about that. Like, like, like how? Like, like what? On in the streets? Like? No, 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 not not in the streets. I think you know, um, when I, I suppose in the football world, okay. sports world, it's a, it's a small industry, and people talk about different successes I had and stuff like that. But they say, oh, but you know, okay, you know, okay. I, but but that's normal. I I don't hate anybody for saying that, but I suppose. It's a price you pay for poor judgment or banking on people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but again, yeah. that's an experiment that I learned yeah. something, right? So I, I got to treat my brand mm. um, much better than I did back then. Okay. Right. Um, so yeah, I suppose that's the learning. But that won't stop me. Right. Like, that's me. I'm an entrepreneur. Tell me one businessman that never failed. Right, right. right? right. That, tell me one entrepreneur that has not put himself out there and got burned in the process. Let's not forget, I've been in this game for almost 20 years. Mm. That I'm gonna have failures. Right. I'm gonna have something that goes bad, right? Yeah. It I can be safe and just sit back and not do anything. Then I don't expose myself to things. But as an entrepreneur, that's what you do. You you create new grounds. You yeah. go into new frontiers. In a way, you're always like a moving target, right? Like it, it's yeah. easy, right? Yeah. Yes, it's yes, easy. It's so easy. so you know, honestly, I mean, like I said, that was quite a few years ago. Legally, yeah. there's no repercussions yeah. in that sense. It's all cleared. Right. So I would say that good, good, good experiment. Good lessons learned. Um, again, as a leader, as an entrepreneur, banking on people is so important, okay. right? The so right people. The right people. So I understood that that's part of the game. I'm, and I'm, like I said, I've moved on from the episode. You once said, my belief in Singapore football can be worth that much, a billion dollars, mm. right? That was in 2016, I believe, mm. okay, there, thereabouts. Do you still believe in that? Um, those things don't go away, okay. right? Don't, those beliefs, those ideas, because my... I told you from the beginning, right? My worldview is very different. Okay. I view things very differently. Right. I look at things in experiments. I look at, you know, I give you giving you an example. When you can make a project that's worth millions out of thin air, then when there's something tangible called Singapore football, I believe I can make it a billion. Right. 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 So reasons behind that. There's many many reasons yeah. behind that. There's some logical, illogical ideas behind this and. But I say it because I truly believe in it. I okay. truly believe in it. In different forums, I articulated where I got this, where this yeah. valuation and all yes. that. I've done that. I won't bore you to death yes. on that. I've done that. Yeah. Um, so the problem is where people find it a little bit ironic or hard to believe. It's the current reality of football. Okay. Right. The right. current reality <laughs> of football cannot allow them to imagine it's worth a billion. I can't imagine. Yeah. 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 It, it, yeah. Uh, it's no fault of yours. Yeah. But I have a different view. Right. Over the 20 years, I've done different experiments. I've done, I've collected different worldviews. I see the diamond mm. where people see coal. Okay. That makes me the 1% of what we do. Right. 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 And, and that's okay. Right. Because when Elon Musk said that he wants to put rockets on, <laughs> people laughed at him. Yes. Today, they're asking him, how can I go along and join? So it happens, but that's, you said it. We are a moving target when we think big. Correct. Now, you were instrumental in bringing back the Lion City Cup, right? And also in bringing uh, Jermaine Pennon, right, a few years back. And, and listen, to, for a period of time, it was brilliant, wasn't it? You know, the crowds mm. coming back, even for training sessions. Uh, we talk about him. Uh, people were talking about him. Obviously, his wife as well. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and 
I mean, football in general, right? And it's, it's good because it's news and and people want to watch that. Why do you think there, there wasn't a follow-up? Because there was an opportunity there and then, right? So I suppose in the past, I've been quite critical of the way football is run and stuff like that. And I always told myself, right, any man on the street can find fault and name the problem. Mm. The 1% is actually who give solutions. Yeah. So I said, okay. Again, coming back to experiments, Line City Cup was an experiment. Yeah. We took a team, the a, a tournament that was underwater and made it world class. Yeah. Then I said, okay, let me experiment with my theory, my hypothesis that if we take a top level player here, okay. we can kind of short circuit this and mm. can give life to something that's dead. Yeah. And Jermaine Pennon, through, I would say, <laughs> some sort of very coincidental uh, casual chats, um, just to give you a bit of context with that one as well. I met Izwan in Tokyo when I was there for work. Izwan Mabut. Mabut. Okay. And Izwan was on trial at the Japanese club, the right. J2 club. Okay. And I met him in Tokyo in one of the hotels, started talking and he said, he's not going to make it. Then he said, boss, are you able to help me? Mm. And by this time, I've already been out of the yeah, yeah. the player's agent yeah. game, right? But I, the boy, I really want, genuinely wanted to help him because he's a talent. We all know he's yeah. a talent. And I say, if I can make a phone call, which makes a difference, why not? Um, doesn't cost me too much. So I got in touch with uh, uh, Sky Edwards, who's the manager for Jermaine Pennon, with my previous dealings with players and stuff like that. And I talked about uh, his one. I said, hey, great goalkeeper. Can you find him a, a Scandinavian club? He, he won't let you down. And the Japan, yeah. Japan game was a... So he said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll help your player if you help my player. I said, well, who's your player? He goes, like, Jermaine Pennant. What? Yeah, okay. so I'm like, who's Jermaine Pennant? Like, <laughs> so he said, no, no, ex-Liverpool. I said, listen, listen, like, Singapore's not a place for that. Like, we can't afford his yeah. salary. He said, no, 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 he wants an experience. He wants to come up. I said, I'm telling you, he's not going to earn whatever. <laughs> and I know prior that he actually had gone to Thailand, yeah. to Mong Tong, and didn't really make it. And yeah. So he said, no, no, no. And the kicker was, he said, Jermaine will come on trial pay for the trial himself. So everything is his? Yeah. So I'm like, hang on a second. So what I did was, I said, okay, give me some time, I'll come back to you. So as soon as he hangs up, I pick up the phone and I call Krishna, yeah. who's a good friend of mine. Was, we yeah. were actually in business together before and he was a chairman at the time. I said, hey, bro, I've got <laughs> Jermaine Pennon who's willing to come in trial and I said, at worst, it's nice publicity for your club. Yeah. And also not to forget that he's a diehard Liverpool fan. Who? Uh, Krishna. Krishna. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, so he's got some vested interest in it. And, and he said, okay, what do I do to make this happen? Yeah. I said, send me an invitation letter, I'll make it happen. So within minutes, he sent me an uh, yeah. a, a, a invitation letter for, for Jermaine. And, and the same night since the conversation, I sent the invitation letter. So Sky told me that in his life as 30 years as a football <laughs> agent, he's never got an invitation letter that fast. Okay. So okay. I said, because we are Singapore, that's how we work. <laughs> so I think I, I, we spoke on Thursday and Jermaine landed on Tuesday. The, the following week, yeah. 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 So, and then the rest is history. So, now, we, we spoke about that, right? Jermaine Penn. How did you think he performed? In, in to, to be fair, to be fair, right at the end, so we did a lot of counselling with uh, Jermaine. Okay. In the sense that we, we, we know who he is, okay. what he's capable of, yeah. off the field. Yeah. So, my team, and I'm big shout out to Sharil Jantan who was working with me at that time. Okay. And I attached Sharil to him. Okay. And I said, what, okay. uh, chaperone? Yeah. Okay. And and also his commercial affairs. Right, right, right. So we got him a sponsorship from Puma. We got him on TV. Okay. So that was Sharil's role to okay. find some opportunities around it. And at the same, same time, Sharil had to be his yeah. kind of thing. And he did a great, great job. And um, so we had him on a lead in some ways. Okay. So that he doesn't... Because okay. we really wanted him to do well for okay. Tampines. And, you know, so hopefully m many more players can come. And it did happen. In the beginning, as you saw, he started playing. Yeah. And then he became the witch hunt for many players. Okay. There's some stupid tackles going okay. on because his salary was... Mm. First of all, the number that was that was uh, reported was wrong. Okay. We played along with it. Right. And then the players got upset and they started having a go at him. The referees didn't... So he didn't get what he was he was reported? There's nowhere near 40,000 a month he was reported. Nowhere near. Okay. Okay. So now that it's not gone, I'll tell you. But players started okay. attacking him. Referee didn't. So he, it all started to yeah. boil under. Yeah. And then I suppose he got into some not very good company at Tampines Rovers. Okay. And then they 
started to show him a little bit of the ah, nightlife and stuff like that. Okay. And then obviously the team didn't start to do well. Okay. And then, you know, obviously he became a reason mm. for him. A scapegoat. Or, scapegoat for of sorts. And then right at the end, he said, you know, even if you bring Messi here, it will be the same. And, and, I, and I agree 100%. Yeah. This is a prime example of a top, top player. The environment is toxic. You yeah. take him and drop him in there. What, what do you think happens? Exactly. What do you think happens? Yeah. So, uh, while he didn't do himself any favours, but I thought the environment didn't help him too. You were rumoured to be signing up to run in the last FAS elections, right? It came out in the papers and stuff. Now, wh- was that true? And any chance of you running in the future? Good question. <laughs> and I'll address the first one first. Yeah. I, um, truth be told, I did explore. Yeah. Purely because from a place of frustration of what been happening. Okay. Then I heard that some names were linked to that and said, come on, you know, you're equally as guilty sitting, standing on the sidelines and watching this circus. Mm. So I did look around and I say, how can I form a team? Mm. But at that time, <laughs> I don't know whether clef- very cleverly or not, they put some rules in place that didn't qualify me. Oh, okay. And <laughs> mind you, it was kind of silly because I've been in football all my life. In fact, I was even a consultant for AFC. Went to fix other people's mm. uh, leagues and whatever not. Consulted the current king of Malaysia, mm. who was my client, and we did the privatization of Malaysian mm. Super League. I had done all of that, but yet I didn't qualify to run. What was that particular rule? They said you have to be involved in local football for two years. What do you mean by local football? Uh, as a capacity of a of a club owner or a something. So which okay again. So okay. I suppose. Um, that's what happened okay. and then I was at the mercy of another because I didn't own any club I was not a voting member I was at mer- mercy of other people to, to hold this together and I also realised that I, don't, I didn't have legs in that sense like right. I was not set up to, to right, do right. this so I kind of just walked yeah. away yeah. Um, and then the media obviously picked it up through the grapevine and yeah. stuff like that so that's what happened in the last um, election future plans? future plans if I'm being completely honest um, I don't have an interest to run. It's it's coming up, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. I think there's a lot of talk around around the election. To be told, would I do a pro bono work? Having been a practitioner for almost twenty years, mm. to a place where <laughs> you, yeah, I, it's a very tough. Yeah, it's it's almost like a national service. Yeah. It's thankless. It's thankless. And I've already served the country twice. I went to army, I played for the national team. <laughs> and, right. and coming back to serve this, yeah. I'm not sure at this point in time in my life that I'm actually prepared, but I will tell you something. I'm definitely not happy with the way things are going. Mm. From my own perspective, yeah. right? My own perspective, we know we all can be much better than where we are. Mm. And a lot of people have asked me, hey, you, I heard you're running, you're putting a team together. The reality is no. Which is, which is related to my next point here, right? You know, you play the game at the highest level, right? Uh, Southeast Asia, and you're also a businessman in terms of the administrator, administration stuff and stuff like that. Now, what is lacking here in S- Singapore football? Football-wise and admin-wise, uh, the business side of things. Do you have another three days? Oh, that's <laughs> tough, man. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, 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 in, in a way, it's kind of like a, a, a silly question. No, no, seriously, right? But, but it's... it's what, what do you think? You know... Um, l- like I said, you know, I, I, I read a lot and I self-reflect a lot and I always look for a place to improve myself, especially from a thought process. Yeah. And that's what I want to excel in, in, in thought leadership. There's something called a circle of competence, mm. right? A lot of people, what happens is that they do something for seven hours, then they think that they are an expert in something. Okay. That's not the reality. Then there are other guys that do 20 years in it, right? Then the other guy with the seven-hour comes into the same circle and thinks that he can actually do what the guy who's been 20 hours. So, just to give you a bit more eye-level example, if you're going to climb Everest, will you do it without a Sherpa? Even though you have trained for it, talked about it, read everything there is, saw every video there is, and climb every other mountain than climb Everest, would you take the risk? Nope. Okay. So, in today in football, what's happening is that you've got people trying to climb Mount Everest without a Sherpa. Mm. That means it's not horses for courses. Mm. It's someone who has an idea of football, treating it the way that they envision their reality, like this is what football should be and nothing else. Mm-hmm. 
and this is where we're going to run it. So for, I would say, the last 15, 20 years, that's what we've done. And while everybody else has realized that this is a business, this is uh, the game has changed and we have to do different things, we've got to approach differently. Not talking about world football, let's look at Southeast Asia, let's, let's do left and right. We look at, okay, maybe Indonesia is not the best example, look at Malaysia, they've had fans. They got the right people in the right place. You're talking about both ways, business as well as football-wise. Yeah. yeah. So I suppose this is something of a shortcoming and, you know, I don't want to paint every, everyone with the same yeah. um, uh, brush. Yeah. There are some really, really, really good people there. Yeah. Then there are really people who doesn't, don't deserve to be there. And clinging on to something that I don't think so they have a role to play. Strong words there. No, no, it, yeah, no it's yeah. not strong, it's the truth. Yeah. I think if you if you put them in a situation and, and ask them those hard questions, they will, you know, it won't take a genius to work it out that they don't have the answers. Your hope for Singapore football? I hope that that in our lifetime, because as you know, you and I are maybe a little bit more <laughs> biased and we've got more skin in the game with our kids. Yeah. And I, when I see my, 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 my boys play, who show a bit of talent, and when I look at the real pathway, thank God they're now with the Lion City Sailors mm. who have a pathway mm. and without the lack of that right where can we allow our kids to dream right can they really dream like I asked myself I said you know Joseph schooling that's one because his parents created the dream for their family but I take that example into football and I look at my own two kids and I say that where are we supposed to dream or are we not supposed to dream like, forget about this. Like, let's just go and study and stuff like that. And I don't think so. So I take my own life and I look at my life and experiments. And I tell my kids, I say, you've got to experiment with your lives. Like, if you don't do that, right, yeah. your life is not fulfilled and you don't know where you reach, right? So when I talk about circling back to the idea of Singapore football is that I just want an opportunity for our boys who are very, very smart. Our kids, you know, yeah, yeah. as compared to the <laughs> generally around the world, our kids are very smart. Allow them to dream. Dream that someday they will be playing the World Cup. Someday they will be playing in a Champions League final. Yeah. Someday they'll be playing in the English Premier League. Because today, when any child mm. tells that I'm going to play in the Premier League, they get laughed at. Yeah. I'll go back to Korea or Japan and they say, I want to play in the Premier League. They say, yeah, you have a... Actually, you're right. Go, go there. This is the pathway for you mm. to take. Mm. That's my dream. I, I, I think the environment is important, right? You, you talk about that and... You talk about people laughing. If if my son, my, my son says that every day, how can I play for Arsenal? And he's like, again, you know, you go goes back to that thought, right? It's easy for me to say, no, you you're never gonna play for Arsenal. Yeah. It's easy for me. It's, anybody will say that actually. Right? And, and in fact, that's the worst thing you can yeah, tell a child. Yeah. So so it's 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 the environment that that you know builds this. And where does R Sasikuma go from here? Interesting. Like my experiments will never stop. I'm forty five. Mm. Let's just hope and pray that I live up to 80, yeah. you know, and I still got half my life left. But my, I would say my, my purpose in life has completely changed after my kids, my boys. Mm. I think they are the forefront of many things my wife and I do as a family. And I look at my professional career myself, I say that I wanted to start a business and sell a business, I did it. Mm. I wanted to do all the cool things that involve with that, I done it. Yeah. I don't want to go back to building a business because it's hard. Mm. I got to practice now. Mm. I got a practice that I help other entrepreneurs reach their, you know, dream and stuff like that. And I do different projects here and there a bit. Uh, I want to, I want to, I want to be a thought leader in mm. the space. I spent twenty years in this business. I want to be a thought leader. I want to be able to write a book yeah. about my thoughts, how to do things differently. But I want to, I want to keep my kids to grow up in an environment where they can be the best version of themselves. Right. And that's my dream. That's my hope. That's my alignment, whether it's in football, outside of football. Um, we never know what the future brings, for yeah. sure. But uh, one thing I'm sure, uh, I won't stop experimenting with my life. That's that's nice, right? Uh, you, because you, you spoke about helping others out. And then I, I know on, on, on social media, you've been helping a few guys out. And that, that's that's great work there. Mm. And I also want that signed copy of that book once it's done. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. that's, that's, yeah. uh, that's a promise. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully, hopefully that, uh, you know, eventually I get to write that book. No, it's not about how great you are when you're, you know, people think that you got to be super successful to write mm. a book. Actually, no. Yeah. You know, um, it, you just need to be inspirational. Any advice... Lastly, any advice for footballers? Because you've done it in terms of, uh, you know, league football, uh, national team football, uh, you know, 
business wise as well, right? But let's talk about the football part. Any advice for young players coming up? I think uh, to start with, if we look at it from a from a perspective of a tree, right? If you can imagine a tree, mm. right? The roots are important. So root means what your your value. Uh, why are you playing football? Always ask yourself. And this is one thing that I've, I, I'm talking to my boys every day. Why are you here? Yeah. Why do mommy and daddy take you to training? Yeah. Uh, we can be doing many other things. Yeah. We can be in the yeah. pool. Time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we could be doing many many things, right? Yeah. Why do we do that? Because the fundamental belief is that we we believe that you can be somebody great, mm. like something great mm. that can come out of this, right? Mm. So that's the fundamental value and belief. And if you are a footballer, if you are a professional footballer today or you aspire to be a professional footballer, you should ask your fundamentals, start with your why, why am I here? Then if that is strong enough, then you look at the, 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 the tree, right? Mm. And say, I'm going to escalate up the tree to probably one day becoming a, a full-fledged tree. The full-fledged tree will not be healthy if the roots are wrong. Yeah. If the roots are not healthy, yeah. this tree will become a, a crooked tree or you know, a rotten tree or whatever, right? So pay attention to that. Always ask yourself that, how can I improve myself? How can I do things differently? How can I be of value to my team, my teammates, everybody else? And then there's one other fundamental thing that you and I probably know and we, um, we kind of half did it and that's why we are here is because we know that during our playing time, we have a lot of downtime. Mm. A lot of downtime. Right. right. We train and then we sit around and don't know God knows what we do. Play CM. And yeah, and whatever, and right? <laughs> so like be useful in that time that's downtime, mm. whether it's learning from somebody else doing an internship, yeah. studying, or whatever. Like, make that moment. That's why when I saw Haris Arun sign, yeah. uh, with, you know, to do his, he was on my show last week, and yeah. encouraging. Skipper of the national team, leading yeah. by example. So I think, for all you know, I mean, that guy doesn't need to work anymore. Yeah. Yet I he's doing so. that. Yeah, yet <laughs> he's doing that, right? right? So I suppose that that's, that's a smart player. I, I, I think that's one of my regrets as well, right? Mm. While, while we were playing, mm. downtime, my friend. Yeah. You Just imagine there's no morning trainings, right? Yeah. You, you wake up and you do F all. Yeah. No, seriously. Yeah, we don't do anything. So, <laughs> that's one of, I would say, if we can go back in time. Yes. Uh, that's one thing I'll fix. Right. How about, let's say, for example, I'm coming up. I'm, I don't know, 16, 17. I want to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. What's your advice? So I always believe, and, I, and I, this is what, one of the things that I do with a lot of uh, businesses and entrepreneurs today, right? And they ask me, like, um, oh, what am I good at, right? Hmm. So I'll tell you, at 16, at 16, you can experiment. Yeah. Because the room for failure is very high. Yeah. Right? So at 16, I don't expect you to, out, uh, obviously, there are some outliers that go on and build multi-million dollar businesses, right? But at 16, what is the easiest you can do? As an entrepreneur, you can buy something and sell something. Yeah. Buy cheap and sell more expensive, and you got, you keep the margin, right? So, if you can experiment that, go on eBay yeah. and whatever, yeah. and look at, or go in Alibaba, AliExpress, buy something, create a nice. Because let's not forget, as a footballer, right? You got some currency. There's highlights on you. Mm. Your Instagram yeah. got more than other people. Yeah. So you're not buying traffic. You're not buying media. Yeah. People follow you and say, hey, I bought this nice sticker. By the way, if you want to yeah. buy it, yeah. it's, it's here. So that can be uh, dipping your toe. More than that, I would say that go and learn from somebody. Mm. Go and be part of an organization and do all the dog work. Yeah. Like you really from the bottom. Just be the guy that carries the water, be the guy that fix the mic and yeah. work your way up. So the 16th is probably dipping your toes and then experimenting. Yeah. 20s. That's where you try to say that, okay, I want to... Okay, even if you're a footballer, right? Mm. I, I really think, in, in given the current context, every footballer should have a job mm. in the role that they think that they are going to go into. It could be coaching, mm. administration, business. Because if you work out a deal with someone and say that I'm going to come in twice a week and I'm going to learn, I'm just a fly on the wall learning. Imagine in 10 years what you can really pick up. It's a great point about the social media hits. Like, like you talk about the, today's players, you talk about the Bihakis and all, right? They've got like thousands and thousands of followers and they, they are, at the moment, they are doing things that we didn't do before. Yeah. You, right? Yeah. You, you talk about Bihaki, he's got his businesses and, and, and uh, yeah. Hassan has come yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. So, they are actually doing things that we should have done before, uh, you know, in a way. If, if I, and I talk about this all the time. After the Tiger Cup, if I had Instagram, my Instagram would have just blown up, right? Yeah. But we didn't have that. Yes. Yeah, but... You know, these guys are smart. Yeah. Very smart. Yes. Like, you know, the names you just mentioned, they, right. 
because they got free free media now. Yes. Free media. Yes. They're harnessing the free media and yes. then making some money out of it. And that's what they sh- a lot more should do. Yes. A lot more should actually do. Rather than going on <laughs> Instagram Live and talking to each other, <laughs> sell something. Yes. Like, sell something. Like, yes. be, you know, if it's a cupcake, sell a cupcake. Yes. Like, you bake something, sell that, right? Yes. So, because I think once you practice the muscle of sales and yes. stuff like that, it will really help you. Sas, this has been an absolute pleasure to, mm. to have you in the, the, the studio doing this. It has been... You know, an eye opener as well. Yeah, I know you. I've known you for a very long time, but s- certain things that I did, I didn't know. I I, I only just knew. And uh, thank you for coming in. It, it's it's been like I said, uh, pretty inspiring. You know, it's going to be inspiring to anyone who's going to listen to this as well. You know, players coming up, uh, entrepreneurs coming up as well, youngsters and and what have you. So, uh, again, uh, good luck for the present as well as the future. Good luck to your sons as well. Mm. I, uh, I I've seen them play. Uh, good good quality, great potential. So. Thanks again, Sas. No, thanks for having me. It's uh, quite weird to be sitting on the other side uh, being interviewed (laughs) because that's what I've been doing the last year. But, uh, you know, I really, really enjoy um, sharing stories, not because, you know, to show where I've come, but I think there's lessons to be learned, right? There's lessons to be learned. And hopefully anybody listening in and, you know, if you you need any help, like I said, I'm always open to especially athletes who who need a a bit of advice, a bit of mentorship. I'm always open, uh, you know, and, you know, reach out to me on, on Instagram or or even on LinkedIn, yeah. and uh, yeah, speak speak to me. I'm I'm happy. Cheers, man. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.